I work in an office, and I've been uh, I've been collecting. Well, let's come out and say it. I've been collecting my boogers for the last uh, ten years. Hmm. Where have you been collecting these boogers? Uh, it's underneath my chair. Hello. Hello. What's up? <gasps> is this Gus? It is. This is Amber. Yes. Oh my gosh. Hi, Gek. I hope you're having uh, an amazing night being a gecko. Thank you very much. That's very sweet of you to say. Um, what's going on with you, Amber? Oh, I'm I'm doing excellent. I'm just extremely nervous, honestly. Don't be nervous. My heart is racing. Uh, don't be nervous. My, uh, you know what? It's like I'm in this. I'm in this mood where, like, I almost wish that we could take both of our hearts and add them together, and then divide them by two, so that way we're both like a little bit. Because right now, my heart's at rest. I'm chilling. I'm maybe even too chilling. I'm maybe even too relaxed right now. And then it sounds like you're the opposite. So maybe we find a way that we meet in the middle, and we're both sort of like just excited enough. That uh, we can have a compelling conversation with one another. Is there a way for us to do that? Do you think? I I love that idea so much. Like I'm pretty sure my heart rate's at like 130. I don't know. I'm just I panic. <laughs> well, listen, Amber. It says here well, that you're wondering you're wondering what your first tattoo should be. That's what you would like to talk about. Yep. I've been wanting to get a tattoo for like five years, and mm. I cannot commit. Mm. What um, what is it that uh, is compelling you to want to get a tattoo? I just love art, I guess, and I want to have a piece of art on my body forever, mm. and. So, like, a long time ago, I wanted to get this tattoo that would say ASAP, but it would stand for, like, always strive and prosper. But, like, after four years of thinking about it, I've changed my mind, and now I'm just too afraid to get something because I don't know what is, like, consistent in my life. (laughs) Mm. See, that, you know, I, I I don't have any tattoos, and that's exactly the reason why, is because I can't imagine... I mean, you're... So this year twenty, um, and you're gonna have this tattoo when you're eighty. So it's gotta, you know, what is gonna be the thing that you identify with now that you will still be identifying with sixty years from now? You know, is there even anything? Is 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 there anything that you can be so sure that? will still be relevant to your life by then. Dude, exactly. Like, literally a year ago, like, my life just got flipped. And now, and I kind of went through an identity crisis, and now I'm just, Mm. like, chilling on Earth. But I, I don't know, everything that I love. Like, I used to play soccer, and then I tore both my ACLs. And, like, I'm getting surgery and quitting that and all that stuff. But, yeah. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Tell me, tell me, why did, um, why did your life get completely flipped around? What happened? Okay, yeah. So, like, I had been playing soccer my whole life. And, um, sorry if my voice is shaking. I'm, like, really nervous. But. No, you sound perfectly fine. Yeah, I was just playing. And then I, (laughs) I tore both. My ACL is like at two different times. I didn't even know about the other, like one of them until I got the other one checked out. And then I just learned I was going to like have to quit soccer because of it. And I didn't realize how much of my identity was in that. Mm. And I just kind of, yeah, I had a hard time like dealing with that and struggled. But I'm doing better now. It's been a year. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. This is uh this is an interesting concept. This is definitely something I want to talk about. Um I I always I think about that all the time. Like trying not to put all of your uh identity eggs 
into one basket because that's just that's a recipe for disaster right it sounds like that's what happened to you you put too much of your identity into soccer and then soccer went away and then you know it kind of fucked you up for a little bit mm-hmm. i didn't even realize how much of my identity was in it <laughs> yeah. until i quit and then i was like super sad but yeah um and also just not being like able to like physically get around as well was probably contributing to it but yeah. well so just, tell me um tell me how you tell me how you realized that so much of your identity was tied up in soccer um uh, i guess like without getting too dark i just after i tore it and quit like I just got really, I guess, depressed or something, but I wasn't, I just kind of isolated myself because I've always tried to, like, portray myself as, like, a really strong, outgoing person, which I am, but whenever I was struggling, I didn't let anyone see, which kind of made it worse, and now it's, like, a year later, and I feel like a totally different person, but... It's hard to show that, especially because I kind of like uh, fell off the grid a little bit. Well, so hold on. So, so I want to get back to the crux of that question. What parts of your identity were tied up in soccer? Um, I guess like my a lot of my happiness and my personality came out when I was playing with my friends Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. I'm really like I guess goofy and just like silly and I could be that way on the field but it's not like as easy in the classroom like I'm in college right now and I really it's it's killing me it's so hard but like I guess that was my place where I could really be myself and be like just goofy yeah but it's not as easy for reason in a classroom and I also just I loved playing like so much and I was like a soccer coach for seven years like it was such a big part of my growing up so Mm -hmm. I think it was just because like growing up I put a lot of time into it so you said that when you found out you couldn't play anymore you got very depressed uh, because a lot of you know your identity was staked up in this and then you said that uh, it's been a year and you're feeling a lot better now. Is that is that correct? Yeah. Tell me what happened in that year that made you feel better. <laughs> um, let's see. Probably like Mary Jane. <laughs> no, no, just kidding. But um. No, I mean, don't. Yeah, I mean, if that if I, if that's if that's part of the answer, you can you can. You know, tell tell me whatever the truth is. Yeah, that could be part of the answer for sure. But I definitely put a lot of like, well, I just, I did have my boyfriend throughout the whole process. And like without him, I definitely would have been completely isolated. So Mm -hmm. spending time with him is like my favorite activity. And then I also started to kind of explore other hobby and interests like music and stuff. Right, right. So I was going to ask, um, you know, aside from, you know, smoking weed and hanging out with your boyfriend, were there other uh, sort of things that you used to rebuild your identity? I don't even know, Gek. I'm. That's a great question. I'm still kind of trying to piece together my identity and that's kind of my plan for the summer because I haven't really had the time to like slow down since last August and Mm -hmm. like since I got knee surgery in December and I've been really busy like I'm an RA at school so like I was putting a lot of like I was basically having to act really happy and like okay especially for my residents and stuff um and it was my first year as an RA but I, yeah. Hmm. You know, Sorry, I, uh, no, it does. It does. I, you know, I kind of want to level with you on this because I, this, like I said earlier, this is something I think about all the time. You know, um, 
I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of, you know, give you my experience with this. Uh, obviously, I'm an internet gecko, and uh, doing this takes up a, a large, large, large amount of uh, my brain power and uh, uh, my thoughts throughout the day. And, uh, you know, when I see somebody from my personal life that I haven't seen in a little bit, it's the first thing that, you know, we start talking about. Um, so it's it's really inherently made up uh, a lot of my identity. And uh, I noticed that. And I and I, I try to nip that in the bud as best as I can, um, which is hard because, mm -hmm. like, you want to have an identity. You want to have things in your life. Uh, like soccer or being a gecko that, uh, you know, contribute to your life and make you who you are because you want to be s someone or something. You want to be able to know who you are a little bit, and so we're using these things as ways to know who we are. Um, and I don't have, like, an answer for this or, or, or an opinion on whether or not it's a problem, but I think about it a lot because I don't know when the hell... Uh, I don't. I don't know how long I'm going to be able to be a gecko for. I don't know how uh, s mm -hmm. safe it is necessarily to stake so much of my identity into this. And so I, I, I try to make an active uh, effort to not base so much of my identity into it. And so I have like a thought experiment that I'm always doing, where I'm like, okay, what if I I, I wasn't this? Uh, you know, how would I? Uh, navigate myself and navigate the world and I'm trying to base my identity more in um, my like philosophies of how I want to maneuver the world like you know I want to think of myself as uh, adventurous resourceful uh, open minded uh, things like that that are more so like traits about myself that you know, whether or not any sort of specific thing in my life, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, being a gecko or, you know, before I was a gecko, I was, uh, I did stand up comedy for a while and I, I realized I hated it and I had a little bit of an identity crisis because I put so much of my identity into that and, um, I had to, I had to move on from that. Uh, but if I sort of cling to, to more like, general broad philosophies of ways in which I want to live my life or approach the world, then I, I've got a little bit better of a, of a, I've, I've got a little bit more of an evergreen toolkit, uh, to operate from mm -hmm. than if I just base my identity on, you know, being part of this club or, or, you know, doing this specific thing, like, like being a gecko or playing soccer. So I've, I've, been focusing a lot on that i don't know if if uh that makes any sense no that's beautiful gag i totally agree like i feel like honestly the identity crisis <laughs> was probably inevitable because i was gonna quit soccer eventually like probably mm -hmm. when i stopped playing in college and had to get a job and like i was probably gonna have time for it so like i guess i'm just grateful that it, I'm kind of grateful it happened. Like it's totally. forced me to grow, and I don't want my whole identity to be in like a sport. So mm -hmm. I I'm happy for it. It just took a while to accept it, but yeah, I, I definitely feel a lot better about it. Yeah, uh, no, I uh, I'm I'm so glad that you're you're looking at it like that as as an opportunity because I think the the more experiences you have in your life of uh, of everything crumbling down, uh, and then you can look at your life and be like, oh, well, two years ago, I was all about this, and then two years before that, I was all about this other thing. So using that information from the past, um, I can gather that two years from now, I might very well be all about something else, and it makes you sort of cling to whatever you're about now a little bit less. Um, but, you know... Before we before we go, uh, what were some things about so because you know I was sort of talking about building a more evergreen toolkit to to cling to than any sort mm -hmm. any sort of um, concrete club 
or whatever you or, or whatever it would be. Um, but what what were some sort of uh, evergreen things about you or skills that you got from soccer that you can kind of take with you, even if soccer itself is gone? Yeah, um, I I would say yeah, soccer helped me a lot develop like social skills and like leadership um Mm -hmm. like I got to be the captain a couple years and just like I played uh my my favorite position is on the field but like I played goalie too and just like commanding the field like I guess has kind of taught me to to command things in life as well Mm -hmm. or just to lead people and I think that influenced me to be an RA right now. But there, there's a lot of, like, stuff I've learned from it. But I definitely, I miss the people. Like, I mm. I had a hard time. I'm having a hard time finding friends now because, like, all my friends were my soccer teammates. So I just am trying to find, like, a new thing, I guess. Like, I really love music, but there's not really any music clubs. So, like, I'm trying to, like, found one or something. I don't know. You should. You should start one. That's the best way to the best way to uh, find the best and even an even better way to make friends than jo- than joining clubs is to start them. I've I've found. I know, um, and because then you are like because then everything rushing. sort of revolves around you, and then and then you know, and I think you can do it because you have, as you said, these leadership skills that you learned um, from soccer that that I think could bode you well in doing that. Yeah, and I feel like I would definitely like. The only other thing I wanted to mention, too, is, like, one thing holding me back a little bit is, like, I have this thing called hyperhidrosis. Have you ever heard of it? Um, I haven't. What is it? It's just, like, excessive sweating, basically, and, like, the hands and, like, mm-hmm. armpits, basically. And it's an actual condition, and, like, I'm so self-conscious about it and especially like the reason I don't want to start a club well part of that is just like being so self-conscious about my freaking sweaty hands and like <laughs> and sweaty pits and stuff I just can't well Amber it. like right now well Amber sorry. uh oh no it's okay man well Amber listen uh uh I think we should go but um I think that the skills that you've learned from uh doing your soccer stuff I think that uh I think that you can start a club if you want to. I think that that's within you. So I think you should go do that. Do you think I can and get I don't, past I, the I don't think hydrosis? anybody. I don't think anybody is going to care about how much you sweat. Really? Oh my gosh, that that's so relieving to hear. Um, I thought people cared, but maybe they don't. No, I don't think anybody's going to care. But uh, thank you very much for calling, Amber. Thanks, Gag. I love you. Uh, super interesting call. Uh, again, a, a building a, a diversified life portfolio is something that I'm, I'm always thinking about for myself. Uh, cause I, every day I think about like, you know, what would I do with my life if I weren't, uh, doing this? Um, and I, I'm trying to, you know, I get a lot of confidence out of doing this, um, and that's on one hand awesome, but then on another hand dangerous, uh, in my opinion, because uh, uh, I, I don't I don't like confidence or uh, any of these other positive life attributes to come from something external. Because uh, as as what happened to Amber with uh, you know ter- I think she she had an injury of some kind um, that prevented her from playing soccer. Uh, soccer was taken away from her. Um, anything can happen that can fuck with whatever external thing you're getting your your good feelings from. So so I try to I try to limit that. Um, it's 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 hard, man. It's hard because uh, on one hand, it's a positive, beautiful thing to interact with the world and all of its external goodies, and to get positive things from those external goodies, whether that be a uh, a career or a club or a friendship or a romantic relationship. 
Um, and you know, I, I guess I guess we should be getting positive things from external sources, but on the other hand, we don't want those external things to kind of be in charge of us or to hold all of our all of our eggs in their basket. So we got to play a kind of tiptoeing game uh, between uh, uh, building up our confidence, leadership skills, social skills, what have you, uh, independently of any sort of external thing, but also uh, enjoying the external things. When we are privileged enough to have them in our lives. Hello? Hello. Hey, is this Shane? This is him. What's going on, Shane? Well, I wanted to talk about a problem I'm having at work. Uh, I work in an office, and I've been uh, I've been collecting... Well, Come out and say it. I've been collecting my boogers for the last uh, 10 years. And uh, there's about to be some changes coming. And I think it's not something that I do openly. Obviously, it's it's hidden. And uh, I think uh, something's about to happen where it's going to get discovered. And I I don't quite know what to do because it's so big that it's going to be noticed. And I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to deal with this. Hmm. Where have you been collecting these boogers? Uh, it's underneath my chair. So when I say changes, they're, they're getting us new chairs. And it's pretty much taken up most of the bottom of the chair. And um, and they're just all there. Like, And it's not like I was set out to like, oh, I want to make a booger collection. It was... I. I've never worked in an office before, and you it know, just I, just, I just, I just never, it's just something, yeah. And you know, you're sitting there and you can't breathe, and you're like, well, I need to pick my nose, and I don't really want to go messing around with a Kleenex or anything. I'll just put them right here, and you do that enough, and then you can start to feel like, oh, well, I, you know, I got a bunch down there, and then I was like, well, this. Maybe this is getting out of hand. Let me see what I got going on. And then after, you know, we're talking years, it's like, whoa, I'm, I'm covering up dang near the whole bottom of the chair. And, so uh, why do you feel like you are about to be discovered? Well, we're getting we're getting new chairs, and the people bringing them in are going to have to dispose of the old chairs. And somebody is going, I mean, I just don't know how they're not going to notice it. it it's... It's if you look at it's out of control. I mean, the whole bottom of the chair is covered in boogers. So, are the people who are replacing the chairs the same people as the people that work in your office? Not necessarily, but they'll they'll know them. They'll they'll have interactions with because because that's part of the cleaning crew. Um, so they come in every now and then, like you know, once a week. So they they know some of the people. Um. So, you know, it could be, I, you know, I could say, oh, good Lord, you know, like, do you know what this guy does? And then I won't know if they're talking about me or, I mean, I'm not necessarily worried about them talking about me, but it just, that's this subject, not necessarily the best thing in the world. Have you, you know? considered uh, replacing the chair yourself before anyone well, else comes to replace it? Yeah, I guess what I would have to do is find the correct model. Um, I hadn't even thought about that. I guess I could just get find a chair that looks identical and try, you know, through cover of darkness, try to try to get that the booger chair out of there and then dispose of it to where nobody can see it. Hmm. Hmm. Why are you afraid of people knowing that you collect your boogers? Well, I don't want to be. I don't want to be the booger guy. I don't want to be like, oh, look at him. It's it's kind of a taboo. I mean, hmm. I mean, it's a bodily function, you know. I mean, everybody's got them, you know. I mean, you think about some of the most attractive in the world. Somebody at some point they've got to blow their nose, you know. You get it. It's 
you, you know, your nose collects that stuff. And for me, I just I just bypassed the Kleenex and I put it in a spot and it got it just got out of hand. And you know, I, I just don't want to be the booger guy. I don't want everybody going. Oh, you know, God. So God, what? You know, what? What is so wrong with being the booger guy? Um. Well. I, I don't know. Just, I think people have a hard time taking me seriously if I ever wanted to try to go for promotion. Like, mm. if I'm having to, if my boss interviews me, they could be like, you know, is it true that you collected your boogers underneath the chair? Mm. And, you know, the, the thing is, you know, all the, and this is where it gets kind of bad, but I, I didn't know this, but apparently boogers got like, if, after a period of time, they have like a bacteria or acidic component. So some of the chair has been damaged. And if I don't replace the chair and they notice that I've now I've damaged, you know, company property on, on top of it. With and, boogers. You know, I mean, not, but, well, yeah. And I mean, getting rid of the chairs anyway. So I don't, I don't think that's a big deal. But I don't want to, like, you know, did you? Did you? I don't know. It's just, I think it's because it's so much. Like, if it was just one or two, I mean, no big deal, you know? I mean, but Approximately. Talking, you know, 10 years. How many boogers do you believe are on the chair? I mean, I mean, we got to be in the. I mean, if you think, you know, once a week for, and we're talking seasonal things. I mean, it's got to be, it's got to be at least three hundred. I mean, at least three hundred. Some of them are in better condition. Over yeah. ten years. Seems like it's not that many, considering it's a ten-year-long period. No. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, with erosion, and since they are biological, I mean, some of them just kind of fade away. So there's probably, like, residual booger, and, you know, they get new boogers on top of them. So that's why the acid kind of, or the the bacteria kind of eats away at the chair. Can you clean the chair, or are we beyond that? If, well, I'd have to get some chemicals, because some of them have hardened pretty pretty good and like i said it's it's starting to eat into the chair you know some of the chairs got like that um like the cork kind of stuff on, underneath them it's kind of like uh yeah. kind of like the stuff in between fake desk you know and mm-hmm. I, it, it would i mean if i cleaned it out i mean if anybody no, they just noticed that i just damaged the chair like what were you doing down there like what were you picking at this all day long i'm not even picking it you know, well shane 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 nose. shane shane um is there's, there's two for you, I see two options. Option one is to let the people know that you are the booger guy. To uh, dive headfirst into your worst nightmare. Wait until you get used to the water. And realize it ain't so bad after all. Or you can go ahead and and replace the chair yourself thereby completely hiding the fact that you are the booger guy to anyone except yourself yeah i think i think i'm going to go with option 2 i think i can mm-hmm. i think i can get a chair replacement and nobody will know i mean mm-hmm. i think i can do that mm-hmm. maybe one day you will feel ready to reveal your truth to the world. But if that day is not today, I understand. I don't know. I mean, well, sometimes I pick my nose and people have caught me doing it. and like, But not where I wipe it, just picking my nose. Dude, I'll pick my nose on stream I don't know right now, I don't think I if that makes you feel better. Yeah, I mean, that'd be great. Maybe we can normalize picking our nose. There we go. There's a booger. See? Now I feel a little bit better about it. At first, I was kind of embarrassed. I guess it's not that big of a deal after all. Shane, is there anything you want to say to the people at the computer before we go? Uh, No, just appreciate your help, man. And you guys uh, stay safe out there. Hey, thanks for calling, Shane. Thanks for taking my call. Bye. All right, so Shane, 
afraid of being the booger guy, unaware of the almost certain fact that in his office are almost certainly several, several other people with his exact same problem, possibly even people with more than 300 boogers under their chair. That's the thing. Everyone picks their nose. Everyone everyone picks their nose. If you say that you don't, you're lying. Everyone picks their nose. You have to. That's what um what was his name? Was his name Shane? What was his name? Hold on. I'm just gonna say the caller. That's what the caller was saying. He was like, when I can't breathe and I need to clear a passageway. I'll pick my nose. That happens to everybody. And so he, should he reveal himself as Booger Man, might empower other folks in the office to live their truth as well. Because I can almost guarantee you that there is somebody else in that office with just as much, if not more, boogers under their chair as the caller. But he won't do it. And I get why he won't do it. I I don't know if I would do it if I were in his situation. But I hope he does whatever he needs to to be able to sleep at night. Hello? Um, Hello? How are you? Um, I'm doing all right. How are you, Jack? I'm hanging in there. Um, what what is your life like? Um, I was actually very interested about the stuff you were just talking about. Um, kind of being able to remove, like, the ego from external validation um because i think that's something i personally struggle with i think that like ties into very well with the description the call screener gave you but um i think it's hard to like fully remove yourself from the world and like how the world influences you and your mood and who you are So it's interesting hearing how you are trying to find more, like, self-validation. Yes. Yes. It is uh, uh, something I think about every fucking day. I don't have uh, an opinion about it because I'm still working through it consistently. But, yeah, the idea of uh, removing the ego from its desire from external validation. um, (laughs) Because just, like, wouldn't that be so freeing? Wouldn't that be amazing? Um, and there's a spectrum to it, I think, because uh, I I definitely, you know, I de- I am totally not uh, removed from um, external validation, but I can see myself, mm-hmm. uh, uh, in, you know, getting more there uh, every year. Uh, so like, you know, it's 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 sort of a a, a spectrum, but um. Yeah, it's very hard to do, but it's it's hard to do because you want to be it's... involved in the in in society, and uh, but you also don't want to let society you know dictate how you feel about yourself. So, what what were you going to say just now? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, it's very interesting because when you were talking about it before, a lot of the things you're using to describe yourself were like your trades, so like the things you were using to make money, um, and I was wondering also how different you felt like when you start like finding like you feel different finding that internal validation like does that like make you happier or like how does that feel for you um hmm. i think that 
I feel ultimately the best when um, I'm like laying and doing nothing and I'm just feeling like grateful and I'm, uh, you know, mm-hmm. being being kind to myself and I'm personally saying to myself, you know, uh, uh, you know, all, all the nice things that I would want to hear from other people. Um, mm-hmm. and you know, it feels, it, it does feel really good when people say nice things to me, but I, I don't think it's, it's sustainable because at the end of the day, if you don't believe those things about yourself, uh, you know, other people could tell you them, but you know, the, the good feelings you get from that are only going to last so long. Yeah. I think I can hear a TV. So oh, we're watching um, Formula One. I can turn it off. <laughs> Formula One is that's racing, right? Yeah, they had um, a TV show on Netflix recently about it, where it's basically like a soap opera about the drivers' lives. And so mm. I'm currently like super into it. Who's your favorite driver? Wow. Um, I really like Carlos Sainz. He drives for Ferrari. Um, Carlos Sainz. What is uh, I mean, what is compelling to you about Carlos Sainz? Um, he's really funny. So, first of all, he's really funny. I won't lie, he's also pretty cute. I mean, half of watching Formula One is like all the drivers are attractive. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like kind of like a reality show, but sports. See, I wonder so. if... Um... Uh, it, it's it can't possibly be a coincidence that uh, all the people that are are good race car drivers are also attractive. They there has to be some sort of correlation there, or 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 uh, some sort of meddling involved in the organizers of Formula One to only pick the most attractive people to drive their race cars. I um oh it's all politics. Formula One is just so like insidiously like it's all about money and politics, um and you have to be like super rich in order to even be able to afford a seat because you bring sponsors with you. Well, anyway, Skyler, um, we talked a lot about what the previous caller wanted to talk about. We've talked about Formula One, but uh, apparently, according to uh, what the call screener has written down, you have your own thing you wanted to talk about. Yeah, I, yeah, okay. Um, I think it kind of goes a little bit with what we were just talking about, where um, for like the last three years, um, every time I either like begin to start dating people or like, you know, I'm shooting my shot with someone, I think we have a dynamic, um, I've gotten friend zoned. And this has happened about four years, four times in a row. And I'm starting, like, a seasonal job next week um, where, like, I live with my, like, coworkers. Um, and I am trying to, like, go into that with, like, a, I, I just need a different mindset, you know. And I'm not sure what to do because I'm taking this as, like, external feedback. Hmm. Um, so, yeah. That's okay, so you're starting a, a new job. You know that you're going to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you said it's a seasonal job where you're living with your co. Is this like a camp counselor gig? Um, kind of. We like run a backcountry hostel, and like there's oh, like ten cool. different hostels in the system. Oh, that's yeah. awesome! Damn, that sounds like it's gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, I, really, um, I did it in the fall. Um, yeah. Oh, so you done it already? Yes, so I did it with the fall, and so the summer people is basically like a fresh bunch of people. Um, But, like, you know, one of the people I got friends owned by is coming back. You know, it's like, (laughs) yeah. Okay. Uh, All right, so you are trying to completely switch up your uh, social strategy slash mindset. Yeah. Yeah, like what, I'm just looking for a better approach. What what kind of approach? <laughs> I'm getting laughed at. Um, I I mean, my current approach is like, you know, 
you flirt with someone by, you know, laughing with them. Um, I think I have a hard time complimenting people physically. Um, so I don't like maybe that would be a better approach for me, like more overt flirting rather than just like, you know, fucking around with them. Um, hmm. Or, you know, my other thought is just, you know, wait till they explicitly express their intentions. You know, it, instead of like shooting my shot, let them shoot their shot first. Uh, okay, so you said that you want to be more uh, overt. Mm -hmm. I think people in general like when other people are, uh, you know, forward with them. You know, mm. so uh, I I think yeah. being being overt about your interest, uh, you know, off the bat, is a good thing. Being overt with people from the beginning will uh, be helpful to you in not getting, mm. as you say, friend zoned. Yeah, I mean, I hate the term like friend zone, obviously. But it's like I have like hooked up with people, you know, like we've hooked up like for like a month or two and then like a month or two into it, they're like, hey, I just want to be friends. Um, and so. Oh, OK. OK. I so, I mean, this is, oh, uh, so this is this yeah, is. Yeah, I guess is, I'm using the wrong word. Yeah. No, this is that, 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 that sounds like a whole other thing. This is like. By the way, are you are you um, are these guys that you're hooking up with? Um, it has been two, it's been 50, 50. Yeah. Okay. 50, 50. Yeah. Two, girls, um, two guys. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, all right. So you're not getting friends. So, so this is a whole different thing. This is you're hooking out with people and they say to you, I don't want to be in an actual relationship. I just kind of want to hook up and be casual. No, they're saying, I don't even want to hook up with you. They're like, saying, we're hooking up and they're like, I'd rather take out the benefits of this. Just be friends. Mm-hmm. What do you what do you want? Um, I mean, I would like just like a reliable friends hook up friends with benefits situation because I mean I'm not exactly looking for a relationship because I do seasonal work and I'm gonna be in different states like three or four times a year. Um but I'm still having a hard time just achieving that. Like and, and like they're breaking up with me while we're still at the seasonal job with like you know halfway through yeah you know this does factor in a little bit uh to what we were talking about because okay you're making your intentions up clear that you want to have you know romantic sexual relationships with these people not just you know platonic friendships um and it's always good mm -hmm. to make your intentions clear um but once you've done that and they're like okay cool i'm down for that too and then you guys do your thing uh, you really have, <laughs> you really have no control whatsoever over uh, uh, what they decide to do from there, um, and that's that's a tough yeah. thing. That's why that's the that's the tough thing about the entire sphere of uh, human existence that is um, that is the the sexual romantic relationship sphere is that uh, you really only have control over how you act on your side, and then the other 50% mm -hmm. is out of your damn hands. Um, so maybe uh, your quest is in uh, acceptance of that 50% that is out of your hands. Yeah, it's more of like, because that's like terrifying, you know? It's like, I, I don't know. I've why, well, why is it well, why is it so terrifying if it's out of your hands? Well, in the sense where it's like you don't know the reason. You know what? I, like, you, why do you need like to know the reason? You somehow, like, well, because like, aren't you supposed to like grow and get better? Like, this is feedback from a relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like someone's telling you, like, hey, like I don't like we we're doing this thing, and now I'm like, you know, I'm done with it. Like I don't feel that way anymore, and it's like okay, either there. And you're the sitting there, and you're something. going, you're sitting there, and you're going, "What did I do wrong? Please tell me." Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, yes, 
because it's hard. They not want, to but this, this right? is probably they, 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 I, uh, most, most people, they're not going to want to have that conversation with you because it's like a little bit uncomfortable, whatever it is. Um, yeah. Whatever well, the mean, answer is, whatever their answer you know? is though, it's, it's, it's subjective. You know what I'm saying? Like, did you even do anything wrong? And then also, why are you even assuming if somebody doesn't, well, like, let's say you hook up with somebody after a while. Here's another thing that people just fucking t- totally never think about at all. Um, mm-hmm. Is, okay, let's say that this person's, you know, you're hooking up with a person. They decide they don't want to, you know, talk to you again, whatever, whatever. That's out of your control. Then, uh, how much of their decision to uh, not want to see you anymore is something that has to do with you versus something that has nothing to do with you. That's all them. You have no idea. Um, and and yeah. I guess your quest for answers could be driven by a desire to, you know, gather feedback upon uh, that you can use to improve yourself. But how much of it is, is how much of it is mm-hmm. it really? How much of it is it really that you're looking for feedback upon which you can improve yourself versus a quest for answers simply to quench your thirst for answers? I don't know because I don't I'm not I'm not I'm not in your psyche, but I would just think about that. Yeah. I mean, I what makes me think like that, it's like it's not it's a control thing almost where it's like, how do I set myself up for success the next time? Or it's like putting up the wall to prevent yourself from getting hurt. So it's like the internet always teaches you. It's like you want to be like growing, hashtag thriving. Mm-hmm. So it's like ha- like getting the right feedback to grow and prevent this from happening the next time. Does that make sense? Here's the hard thing: is how 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 much of the ex- how much of the workings of the external world, the decisions of other people, are 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 preventable. This is this is the great conflict of yeah. the. Of the uh, of the sexual romantic sphere of human existence of relationships and whatnot is uh, uh, so much of what mm-hmm. the other person decides to do. We think of it as preventable in some way, but it's it's fucking not. It, it's 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 the fifty percent that's outside of your control. It's 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 not preventable yeah. by you. It's 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 out of your control. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess that's the scary, exciting part of it. In the end, what's your name again, Skyler? Skyler. Skyler. Um, Skyler, was this conversation of any amount of um helpfulness to you? Um, what I'm hearing is that I mean, it's just about accepting the unknown. Um, and like having, I know it's about building back my confidence, back up, and knowing that you know it's exciting, and that's half the fun of like hooking up with people is the like excitement of it. Um, I would just not stress so much about the uh, the final thing I'll say to you is I would just not stress so much about the aspects of this whole thing that are outside of your control. Um, Mm -hmm. Whether or not people like you is outside of your control. You know, you go and do the best that you can to uh, be honest about your intentions to, um, you know, be, you know, to present yourself to the world, however you want to be you know presented but everything outside of that Mm -hmm. uh how you're received uh whether or not people want to hook up with you or be in a relationship or whatever it is 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 you have to just accept that it's outside of your control and not you know get too worked up about it yeah no you're right is there anything (laughs) else that you want to say to the people of the computer before we go skylar um i went to your first New York City live showing. Um, my, I, I called yeah. in as um, Gigi before. Um, and yeah, it was really cool meeting you. Um, and yeah, you're really, I keep doing what you're doing. I th- really think you're helping a lot of people. Um, Thank including you very me much, tonight. Because I haven't called in since 2020. So it's nice to talk to you again. <laughs> well, shit. Thanks for watching so long. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, have a good one and uh, good night, people. The computer, Skyler, forever. Um, I think all the time about why is every like like why is every song 
about fucking sex or love or some girl or some guy. Every every song, every song is about some fucking girl, some fucking guy, some fucking thing. It's every song. Um, why are why are so many calls on this podcast about that as well? Um, because it's a compelling part of human existence is uh, us fucking each other. It's a compelling part of human existence. Um, and that's why people get so down when other people, uh, you know, when they experience conflict in that arena. Um, and the, the, the hardest part of conflict in that arena is accepting that 50% of it is not up to you. Um, but I hope Skylar, in any event, has fun at this hostile retreat thing. It sound, it does sound like fun. Hanging out at a hostel. Playing Monopoly. Getting to uh, look at the sun. I don't know why I said that. I needed another thing to say. I needed another thing to say because we're doing a damn podcast and part of doing a podcast is saying things. All right. Thank you for calling, Skylar. Hello? Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> What's up? Um, Nothing much. Just kind of folding and watching the stream folding like like life folding like you're you you can't take it anymore and you're you're folding um no um it's not really that deep i'm just folding clothes <laughs> ah folding clothes no, that's what i thought you meant yeah um yeah. myra uh what is it that you called in to talk about today um so it's funny actually so when <laughs> Ever since I was younger, I have always been really, really, like a really deep sleeper. And it's been really hard because I've actually um, missed events and stuff. Like yesterday, <laughs> yesterday I actually was going supposed to go out with a friend and I couldn't wake up to my alarm. Um... And she kept calling me and stuff, and I felt really, really bad. We did eventually, we, I, I did, like, when I woke up, I called her immediately and was like, oh, my gosh, are, did you still want to go? And she was like, yeah. And hmm. she forgave me, but I still feel really bad about it. <laughs> um, what other events have you slept through? Um, so, it's, okay, when I was younger, I also, uh, I lived in Tennessee and in Tennessee there were a lot of tornadoes where we were and um so uh we had a little we had a little uh tornado closet in our basement to hide in whenever there was a tornado and there were a couple times actually where my mom would drag me down from uh the second floor to the basement into the tornado closet and I didn't wake up until the morning. <laughs> so I would sleep through a couple tornadoes, actually. You would um, sleep through tornadoes? Yeah, I, I did sleep through a couple tornadoes. <laughs> um, um, yeah. So you would go to sleep And then wake up and look outside mm -hmm. your window, and there would just be all sorts of carnage, I assume. Yeah, so uh, I would wake up, and usually it'd be like our fence was... There was one time I slept through a tornado, um, one of the two, and the tree had actually fallen onto our fence and broken it and was in our yard, like our neighbor's tree. And uh, the other time I slept through a tornado, I ac I, like... I sometimes, like, fight 
in my sleep, if that makes any sense. So I, I, I punched my sister in the face and didn't wake up for that either. <laughs> um, you punched your sister yeah. in the face in your sleep. Yes. Was and she upset with I you? I think I like, huh? Was she upset but, with you? Yes, she was very upset with me, but my mom told her to um, that I was asleep, so it was fine. Um, I did get into a little bit of trouble, though, because <laughs> my mom, well, not trouble as in I got a punishment. She just kind of scolded me afterwards and was like, just <laughs> stop doing crazy crap in your sleep, <laughs> which I couldn't help. <laughs> Right, so how did you respond to that scolding, knowing that there was really nothing you could do to change your behavior? Um, I I don't necessarily remember. I think I just kind of took it and went on. Um, but yeah, it's it's been kind of getting a little difficult with this deep sleep because, um, I've actually, like I've said, I've missed events before. There was one time where my, my friends, like a couple years ago, where my friends went up to my house and were knocking on the doors and windows, and I didn't hear anything. <laughs> and, yeah. And mm-hmm. I think also it, it's been kind of a little bit difficult. Like, not only am I, like, naturally a deep sleeper, but... Like a, a couple years ago, I was uh, I was pretty like in a depressed state, and I think I've gotten over that. But I used to use sleep as my escapism, so I didn't have to mm. deal with the world around me. <laughs> so I've been um, trying to get over that. Um, I mean, sleep is a fantastic escape. Because it's almost like you're dead for a little bit, but you get to come back at the end. Yeah. What is it you wanted to ask me? Oh, um, I just wanted some, like, advice as to, um, like, how to get over it. I've tried a lot of alarms, and usually before I go to sleep, I'll try to train myself to an alarm if I'm changing the sound. And I'll be, uh, I'll listen to it for a while and I'll tell myself to wake up to it. But like, it seems as though unless someone is like, I don't know. I, hmm. I, 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 I literally have no clue how to wake up. Oh, I have an idea. <laughs> I have an idea for you. Hmm. Tell your sister. So here's what you do. In order to make things right with your sister, you let her punch you in the face to wake you up. That that would be a nice idea. Um, except I live with two roommates and I'm out of the house now. So? Should I call her to try to get her to come over in the mornings and punch me in the face? How far away does she live from you? <laughs> An hour and 30 minutes. <laughs> How badly do you think she would want to punch you in the face? Um, I don't know. She she gets pretty upset with me, so maybe quite a bit. I feel like this is a good way um, for you to both uh, have a reliable way of waking up in the morning, and then also to make things right for the the ills that you might have caused in the past. Yeah, I think that's some interesting advice. I might talk to her about it. Um, yeah. Is but, there anything else that yeah. you want to say to the people of the computer, Myra? Um, remember to wear your seatbelt and have a good night. Thank you for calling. Thank you. See, that was, um, you know, I, it sounds like a medical issue. It sounds like a medical issue. Uh, do I have any actual advice as to how she can wake up? 
I mean, look, the sister punching you in the face thing, I feel like, uh, you know, I, I think at first when I gave the advice, it was a little bit in jest. But now that I'm really thinking about it, kind of not that bad, not that bad of an idea. Except for the fact that she lives an hour and a half away. The logistics of it don't work. Maybe one of her roommates can punch her in the face. I guess, uh, well, I don't know. I guess getting punched in the face, then she'll get like a concussion and then she'll sleep into her concussion and then she might die. So, so you know what? I take it all back. I take back my idea. Folks, it takes a, um, you know, a humble gecko such as I to know when he's given bad advice and I'll own up to it. Asking this girl to have her sister or roommate punch her in the face. Not a good idea. Hopefully she sees a doctor. Cliff? Hey, it's the gecko. How, how are you, Cliff? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing okay, man. Um, you know, I'm hanging in there. Uh, what's going on with you? Uh, nothing much. I'm kind of packing up some stuff right now to take to my girlfriend's because I'm moving in with her in a couple of weeks. Are you excited about that? Yeah, I'm pretty excited. Um, it's a lot of stuff to do, but yeah, it's new chapters and whatnot. What, uh, tell me about the chapter you're leaving behind. <sighs> uh, chapter I'm leaving behind was the first time I've ever lived really alone, alone for realsies for the past year. Um, mm -hmm. After I got out of a divorce, uh, spent some time to myself for a year. It was pretty nice. Played a lot of video games. So you enjoyed the time that you spent by yourself. You weren't lamenting uh, your divorce. Uh, the first few months were, were pretty lonely, honestly. Um, but I've come to really enjoy it, yeah. Okay, so you got divorced you ever, and you uh, met um, and you met a new and you met a new lady. Uh, how did you meet this new lady? Uh, it's through a mutual friend um, at work. Or we don't really work together anymore, but a, a mutual friend at my job. Yeah. Mm. And um, what what drew you to her? Oh. Uh, I mean. She was attractive, first of all, so that was nice. And that's, uh, that's always a plus. Yeah, that's a plus. And we we just hit it off. I guess I guess there is chemistry. You you know when you speak to someone when you feel there's something mm -hmm. there. You know that mm -hmm. that just happens. Hmm. Um. So you're moving in with her, and this is this is not the first time that you have uh lived with a partner because you lived with your wife correct no no yeah yeah i was married for quite a while and you know i've and i've lived with roommates and you know right out of high school i moved in with a girl mm -hmm. uh yeah so really the unique experience is, is living on my own and um are there things that you think you will miss about living alone once you move in with uh, with your partner? Yeah, I'm going to miss being able to play video games whenever I want, and I'm going to miss my cat. <laughs> I'm going to give... You, you have uh, to give the cat away. The cat that chose me a new... Yeah, because, well, look, I'm, I'm honestly allergic to her, but she's great. But the, the woman I'm moving in with has three cats and a dog, and I just I can't do that many animals. So I'm just going to give away this one that I have now, but it makes me sad. She's, she's a good kitty. She followed mm. me out to the dumpster this morning, followed me all the way back inside like a dog. She's a good kitty cat. She's a queen. Mm. Do you think uh, Do you think she's upset with you about leaving her? She doesn't know yet. You know, she's going to give me that blank kitty cat stare. She doesn't know. Do you think? Do you think she'll be upset when she sort of slowly finds it out? 
Yeah. Yeah, she will. It hurts. It hurts to think about to leave the kitty. You know, I'm going to give her to my ex wife. My kids are going to have her. So, you know, that's, oh. she's also going to realize that now she's stuck with a four year old. And, and that's not going to be any fun for her. So, yeah. So, you're so giving her to your kids. So, you're not. So, you're not explicitly giving her away and never seeing her again, you know, to, to some sort of stranger or facility. You are giving her to your kids. So you will see her again at some point. Yeah, I'll see her again at some point. I've just grown okay. really strangely attached to an animal in a way that I never have before. Really? Are you, uh, why do you feel like it's taken you this long to, to be attached to an animal? Have there been animals in your life previously who you just didn't feel as much chemistry with? Yeah, I've had, I've had pets in the past. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, I, I don't know. I hadn't thought about it. I talked to this cat. And yeah, I've had pets in the past. Um, my ex-wife had cats when I you know, initially started dating her. And I, I started to take care of those animals, but those were hers. And, I know. Queen has been mine, and yeah, she's she's carried me through this time, maybe. And how are you feeling about moving in with, you know, moving in with uh, your girlfriend doesn't seem like it's as much of a uh, hard shift as it is to be moving in with three cats and a dog. Yeah, yeah, especially if, like, you take four living creatures, usually at least one of them is going to be an asshole, right? And, and one of those cats is an asshole. You're going to have mm -hmm. to get used to that. The dog's nice, though. I like the dog. What kind of dog? But, yeah, it's so much fur. It's a lot of fur. I'm going to be sick all the time. Mm. Cliff, I know that we've been talking about dogs and cats and whatnot this entire phone call but is there sort of anything in particular that you you wanted to call in to talk about i i really called in because before the show you were talking about things that hinted at the nature of identity and who we are based on our experiences mm. and i thought you would ask about that and so that's kind of why i called because Sometimes I have a lot to say about that, but I'm, I'm good with cats and dogs, too. Mm. So we could either talk about cats and dogs or the very nature of our identity. Ooh. Do you think there's anything like permanent about who you are that is the same your entire life? Physically or like, emotionally? Anything, it, it could be either, right? Um, I mean, it's easy to say that, like, physically we're not the same thing from beginning to end because eventually all the cells in your body are replaced. But mm. most people still think that, like, I am the same thing in some way from when I was seven. But are you really? Because there's so much change over that time. And religious mm. people would tie it to a soul and say that's unchanging. But it's hard to say a person is like a definite thing unless there's something to them that doesn't change. What is it about you that you feel is uh, consistent throughout your life? Uh, I, I don't think there's any one thing to a person that necessarily makes them who they are. And one of the reasons why our identity is constantly in flux is because there's not as much internal, I think, that makes you who you are like, or nothing that is really like native to you or essential to you that's an internal aspect of you that makes you who you are more than it is like your relations to things in the world that make you who you are. So like your Ooh. relation to your family, your relations to your job, I think those things, and yes, those things are constantly in flux, but they make you who you are sometimes more mm. than your physical makeup, mm. your 
emotional or like mental makeup because those things can change. Like at some point, my father had a stroke and his personality changed, right?、Mm. So his mind. So this is interesting. This is an interesting still... thing that you bring up.、Um, that who we are is more about our relationship to the world and to other people. Uh, because I always think about、uh, personal growth,、uh, in like, like when I think about self development, I, I imagine it taking place in like a vacuum. You know, I always imagine that I'll, you know,、yeah. sh- fly away to Thailand and uh, uh, you know get a cabin in a remote, <laughs> you know, in the jungle and just do a thousand pushups and read a bunch of books and meditate all the time, and then I'll come back and then I'll. I'll、uh, You know, be a changed, developed person,、um, and there is probably a little bit of a little bit of truth to,、uh, you know, the development that you can have in isolation. But maybe that's limited, and maybe the greatest wealth of development takes place in our relationships. Uh, with other people and with the world around us, I don't know. I, that's something I don't want to admit, but that I, I see where you're coming from on it. And the reason I don't want to admit it is because、uh, maybe it comes from a, a little bit of fear. You know what I mean? Because you know, you don't have control over the external. You don't have control over、uh, what other people think of you. You don't have control over. What your spouse thinks of you, what your friends think of you, what you know, the, the people you interact with on a daily basis think of you, or or anything like that. You have control over how you act towards them, and and in a way how you present、yeah. yourself. But you don't have no control over over how you're perceived outside of that.、Yeah. Um, so it's it's hard to admit、uh, that that is an important. Factor in who we are as people, because I don't want to admit that I'm stubborn. I don't want. I, I'm 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 fucking stubborn, and I don't want.、Uh, I want to deal with the external world as little as possible. It's a weird thing for me to say、uh, as I'm broadcasting to、uh, a bunch of people living in the external world, but、uh, you know, I'd like to believe that things are are more within my control than they're not. Um. But Cliff,、uh, this has been a, a fun little philosophical exercise to、uh, to do with you. In addition to this conversation about cats and dogs, is there anything else that you want to say to the people at the computer before we go? No, I just I hope everyone out there is good to those people around them in their lives and their and their relations. Be good to each other, y'all. Thank you for calling, Cliff.、And、it was a pleasure talking to you. Pleasure、Thank、talking you. to you as well. I liked Cliff. The call screener noted that he's a philosophy major, so that's where that comes from. I liked the point he brought up. I hope I understand it. Sometimes I listen back to the podcast and I'll I'll realize that I totally didn't listen. Like I I can tell from I can tell from other people's responses when they aren't actually listening to me, and then sometimes I、uh, listen to this back and I can tell from my responses that I wasn't actually listening to the person. But I think I I think I was listening to Cliff. I think I understood what he was trying to say. I hope I did.、Um, about this whole internal、uh, versus external, which is more important in terms of who you are. It's a it's a struggle because I don't want to admit that your relationships with other people and with the universe and whatever is is who you are because that would be giving. The universe that would be giving the external world so much power, and 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 sometimes I'm I'm mad at the external world. I'm like fuck that. I don't want the external. Fuck yeah. Fuck the external world. Fuck all the people and all the things and all of their opinions and all of their everything. You know, fuck it all. I I don't want that to be in charge of who I am. I'm in charge of who I am. But maybe that's stubborn. I don't know. I don't know if either viewpoint is is right or wrong. All I know is that I am a gecko on the computer.